On February 26, 1984, the Nassau County Police Department received a distressing call from a neighbor residing below the 3412 Ocean Harbor Drive apartment in New York, which belonged to Susan Eigen. Upon arriving at the scene, the officers were met with a truly horrifying discovery. What we saw was one hysterical person, another woman off to, you know, in the kitchen told us that someone was dead upstairs. They found the lifeless body of 41-year-old Susan Eigen, the mother of three lying in the hallway between the bedroom and the hall. In an even more heinous revelation, the police also uncovered the lifeless body of Susan's 17-year-old son, Richard, in the master bedroom. Who could have been responsible for committing such heinous acts? What possible motive could have driven someone to commit this unspeakable tragedy? Welcome back to Mysterious Hook, where we uncover little-known cases from all around the country. Today we are delving into the chilling and perplexing double homicide that shook the nation in 1984, the tragic deaths of Susan Eigen and her son Richard Eigen. But before we continue, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, be sure to hit that subscribe button and show us some love with a like. Without wasting any more time, let's get started. Nestled along the shoreline of New York, Ocean Harbor Drive is a picturesque coastal avenue that exudes an air of tranquility and luxury. Lined with elegant waterfront homes and upscale properties, it is a coveted residential neighborhood that attracts the affluent and those seeking a serene coastal lifestyle. However, the allure of Ocean Harbor Drive in New York can sometimes conceal the shadows that lurk beneath its beauty. The haunting and tragic case of Susan Eigen and her son, Richard, serves as a stark reminder that even in idyllic settings, darkness can find its way. Susan K. Eigen, born in 1942, faced a tumultuous journey through life. As her marriage with Al Eigen crumbled, she mustered the strength to take a bold step forward and separate from her husband. She began to live independently and rebuild her life from scratch alongside her three children, Richard, Karen, and Michael. Her new beginning commenced at 3412 Ocean Harbor Drive in Long Island, New York, where she embraced hope for a brighter future. Amidst her peaceful surroundings, she gradually assimilated into the community, forming connections with her neighbors. Her efforts to start afresh seemed promising, and visitors from the neighborhood occasionally graced her home, giving her a sense of belonging. Little did she realize that the semblance of a normal life she had worked hard to establish was soon to be brutally shattered. It was February 26, 1984, and the innocence of a typical Sunday was soon to be turned into a nightmare for 11-year-old Michael Eigen as he returned home from a neighborhood hockey game. Instead of the warmth of his mother's presence, he was met with a chilling and gruesome scene. Susan Eigen, his mother, lay lifeless in the hallway, her body savagely beaten and strangled an unimaginable sight that would haunt the young boy for years to come. He immediately ran to a neighbor's house, begging for help. Upon receiving the distress call from Susan's downstairs neighbor, whose name was not made public, the Nassau County Police Department arrived at the scene. As they entered the house, their eyes were met with the lifeless body of Susan, lying in the second floor hallway, right in front of the master bedroom. It was Susan Eigen laying in the doorway between the bedroom and the hall. She was in a fetal position, she had a, uh, looked like a collar made out of a belt around her neck. The police knew from their first glance that she had been a victim of assault. However, the darkest revelations were yet to come as the officers ventured into the master bedroom. When the police stepped inside the bedroom, they found Susan's 17-year-old son, Richard, also dead. He was bound to a three-step type entranceway up to the master bed and he was bound by the wrists to the railing and uh, he was suffocated and strangled. He had uh, wires around his neck, a plastic bag over his head and the bag was covered by a gray coat. After ensuring the area was secure, officers Otto Kohlmeyer and Ed Carter of the Nassau County Police Department requested backup. Detective Herb Daub arrived at the crime scene and commenced a comprehensive investigation of the crime scene. The forensic team recovered a white bedsheet stained with blood, found in close proximity to Susan's body. Additionally, they collected hair strands from the bandana that had been used to strangle her. Bodily fluids were also found inside the home and collected as evidence. The bedroom exhibited signs of being ransacked, resembling a typical scene from a botched robbery. Dresser drawers were left open, and the contents of a pocketbook were scattered across the bed. 
But it appears to have been a burglary gone bad. Uh, that was probably our first theory. During the crime scene investigation, the forensic team discovered two latent fingerprints. The first one was lifted from a bank receipt found amidst the scattered items on the bed, and the second one was recovered from the plastic bag used to suffocate Richard Eigen, which was still covering his face. Subsequently, the collective evidence was sent to the laboratory for further analysis and processing. With this theory in mind, investigators speculated that Richard had unexpectedly arrived home during the attack on his mother, having witnessed the crime he was murdered to prevent him from talking. My theory is that he walked in while his mother was being beaten or raped or attacked or whatever. And maybe he's screaming, maybe he's yelling. He put a bag over his head to quiet him. Now the kid's still yelling or he could see his face through the bag. He put the coat over top of him to muffle the sounds. And then he went back and uh, did whatever he had to do with uh, Mrs. Eigen and eventually murdering her. While the initial evidence seemed to support this theory, actually proving it would be another challenging task. In 1984, the field of forensic analysis lacked the advanced and sophisticated techniques available today. This limitation made it significantly more challenging to obtain definitive and conclusive results from the collected evidence. Investigators had to rely on conventional methods and technologies, which might not have provided as precise and detailed information as modern forensic techniques do. In August 1984, Detective Charlie Costello from the Fingerprint Division of the Crime Lab was performing tests on the latent fingerprints that were collected from the bag used to suffocate Richard and another from the bank receipt collected from Susan's purse. Believing that these fingerprints might belong to the intruder, Costello ran the prints through the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or APHIS. And we started looking into burglary patterns in the neighborhood, people that had been involved in the police in the general area. All hope early on was that the fingerprint uh, evidence would lead us to a particular person. However, despite his efforts, he was unable to find a match in the system. Any prints that I saw on my, that came across my desk on other cases I was working on, if it had a similar pattern uh, to the print that I knew was on the Eigen case, I would compare the Eigen print against that case. Since the murderer had no previous criminal records on file, the detectives decided to broaden their search by collecting fingerprints from individuals in the local area with a history or background in burglary. The idea was to compare these fingerprints with the ones found at the crime scene, hoping to identify a potential match or lead that could help them narrow down their suspect list. This method, though time-consuming, aimed to cast a wider net in their investigation and increase the chances of finding a connection to the perpetrator. Despite their diligent efforts and months of testing numerous fingerprint samples from potential suspects, the investigators were unable to match the fingerprints found at the crime scene. As time passed, they brought in as many samples as possible, but none of them yielded any results. Sadly, after nearly a year of exhaustive investigation, they had run out of new fingerprints to test, and without any viable suspects or leads, the case eventually went cold. After 18 years on January 22, 2002, Detective Charlie Costello decided to try his luck once more and ran another fingerprint through APHIS, hoping for a breakthrough. To his immense relief, this time he obtained a positive result. Costello successfully matched the fingerprint found on the evidence to a fingerprint submitted on a school bus driver application. The applicant's name was Louis Talisi. Upon discovering this match to Louis Talisi, investigators learned that he was 42 years old at the time of the crime and had a history of drug possession. With Louis Talisi identified as the prime suspect, the cold case detectives exercised caution and patience, deciding to gather more concrete evidence before making an arrest. In February 2002, DNA analysis McCarthy employed an ultraviolet beam to detect bodily fluid stains on the evidence that were collected from the crime scene, which were otherwise invisible to the human eye. Successfully collecting the fluid, McCarthy extracted a partial DNA profile from it. Armed with this partial DNA profile, the detectives knew they were getting closer to solving this case definitively. The only missing piece now was a sample of Louis Talisi's DNA to compare with the extracted profile and confirm the match. It was finally time for them to find Louis Talisi. On May 10, 2002, the task of securing Louis Talisi's DNA fell to Detective Tony Graziano, a skilled and well-organized undercover agent from the Nassau County Police Department. 
His mission was to discreetly obtain a covert DNA sample from the suspect without alerting Talisi to the ongoing investigation. We devised a plan where I would go to uh, Louis Talisi's home with uh, Detective Sergeant Lucy Guido posing as my wife, and we would be prospective uh, purchasers of the home. At 11 a.m. on May 10, 2002, Detectives Graziano and Sergeant Guido initiated their operation by conducting a walkthrough of Louis Talisi's residence. The purpose of this walkthrough was to familiarize themselves with the layout of the house and gather any potential information that might be useful during their interaction with Talisi. Following the walkthrough, Detective Graziano took the lead in establishing a rapport with Talisi. Building rapport is a crucial skill in undercover work, as it helps gain the trust and confidence of the suspect. Over the course of their interaction, Graziano engaged Talisi in casual conversation discussing various topics to create a comfortable and friendly atmosphere. The detectives knew that they had to approach the situation delicately, ensuring that Talisi remained unaware of their true purpose. Their goal was to gain Talisi's trust enough to obtain a covert DNA sample without raising any suspicion. And basically, I knew I connected with them. We were talking like two, you know, city guys. You know, we were... Uh... Fast buddies. As Detective Graziano and Sergeant Guido continued their walkthrough of Talisi's home, they maintained a casual atmosphere, with Talisi smoking a cigarette during the conversation. Subsequently, they stepped outside onto the street, where Talisi eventually discarded the cigarette butt without suspecting anything amiss. Their orchestrated plan was progressing as intended. After Talisi left the area, Sergeant Guido discreetly collected the discarded cigarette butt. They were both on the street and I was back on the driveway. And uh, when I saw Talise walk back towards the lawn, uh, Detective Graziano pretty much gave me like the sign, come over by me. Told Sergeant Guido to bend down like she was tying her shoe and pick up that cigarette butt. Because I had seen Lewis take it from his hand, throw it directly to the ground. So I had the continuity that that's directly evidence from him. Detective Graziano and Guido wasted no time and immediately made their way to the crime lab. In the crime lab, the analysis carefully isolated the saliva and epithelial cells from the filter of the cigarette butt. The DNA present in the sample was extracted and purified, ensuring the removal of any potential contaminants. With the DNA profile from the cigarette butt now prepared, it was time to compare it to the previously extracted partial DNA profile obtained from the crime scene evidence. As expected, the moment of truth arrived, and the comparison revealed an undeniable match between the two DNA samples. The results confirmed that Louis Talisi was indeed the killer, linking him conclusively to the crime scene and the murders of Susan and Richard Eigen. After building a solid case with concrete evidence against him, Louis Talisi was finally arrested on June 5, 2002. Law enforcement officers took him downtown for questioning. In the Nassau County interviewing room, Louis Talisi was confronted with the evidence collected by the detectives, including the crucial fluid sample that linked him to the crime scene. Talisi, displaying his cunning nature, quickly latched on to a potential defense strategy. He acknowledged knowing Susan and cunningly claimed that he had a physical relationship with her. According to his statement, this explained the presence of his bodily fluid inside Susan's home, suggesting that it was not related to the murders. Talisi further stated that at the time of the murders, he lived in Brooklyn and had been introduced to the Eigens by friends who lived next door to them. Subsequently, Talisi had met the Eigens on several occasions in the past. However, the detectives asserted that on the day of the murder, he was not an invited guest. The cold case detectives didn't believe Talisi's statement, but they knew the potential complication Talisi's statement might introduce during the court proceedings. They understood that handling it with precision was crucial. Nonetheless, they held one last decisive piece of evidence, a trump card that if presented skillfully would leave Talisi with no escape route. On July 3, 2002, DNA analysis Terry Melton took possession of two strands of hair that were recovered from the bandana used to strangle Susan Eigen. Melton then extracted a DNA profile from the hair samples. The crucial step was to compare this newly obtained DNA profile with Louis Talisi's existing DNA profile. We had hairs from several known individuals, including uh, Louis Talese, who was the suspect in the case. And what we found was that one of the hairs matched the type of Louis Talese. And with DNA analysis of the hair strands from the bandana, 
matching Louis Talisi's DNA profile. The final piece of the puzzle was completed for the cold case detectives. After the completion of the investigation and the compilation of a strong case against Louis Talisi, the Eigen double murder case was handed over to the Nassau County District Attorney's Office. The district attorney's team reviewed the evidence and prepared for the trial. The case was put on the court docket and trial proceedings began. Assistant DA Robert Bianca Villa painted a picture of death to Lisi fashion for Susan and Richard Eigen. He thought nothing about the manner in which he strangled and killed Susan. He thought nothing about taking a plastic bag and tying it in a knot over the head of a 17-year-old boy and then strapping him to a banister and essentially watching him suffocate to death. All right, this is a person that is never going to accept responsibility for what he did and deserves, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely no mercy. Despite the mounting evidence against him, Louis Talisi remained unwilling to confess to the murders. His defense attorney, Michael Washor, put forth a defense strategy to create reasonable doubt in the jury's minds. Washor claimed that Talisi was attempting a family gathering on the day of the murders, suggesting an alibi to counter the prosecution's case. In an effort to cast doubt on Talisi's involvement, Washer also proposed the possibility that other individuals who knew the Eigens may have been responsible for the crimes. During the trial, Louis Talisi took the opportunity to briefly speak in court. He expressed his deepest condolences to the families of Susan and Richard Eigen, acknowledging the profound loss they had suffered. However, he also maintained his stance, asserting that he was innocent of the crimes he was accused of committing. Michael Eigen, Susan's son, addressed the court and shared a haunting memory that had stayed with him since the murders. He recounted an incident that occurred four years after the tragic events, when he and his teenage friend found themselves on a boat with Louis Talisi. Michael revealed that Talisi's cousin lived next door to him, leading to this unexpected encounter. According to Michael's testimony, Talisi appeared to be in a state of distress, consuming alcohol and smoking while talking at length about himself and his perceived misery in life. With poster-sized photos of his beloved mother and brother displayed behind him in the courtroom, Michael continued to address the jury. He shared how deeply he had been affected by the defense's portrayal of his mother during the trial. Louis Talisi's defense attorney had attempted to create reasonable doubt by suggesting alternative scenarios and other potential suspects. In doing so, they had painted an unflattering and distorted picture of Susan Eigen. In a powerful and emotional courtroom scene, three other relatives of the victim also addressed the court during the sentencing phase of the trial. Al Eigen, Susan's former husband, and Richard's father turned toward Louis Talisi and directly expressed the magnitude of the devastation caused by his actions. He described the murders as the most horrific crime imaginable, one that had torn apart a family. Al Eigen acknowledged that no sentence could ever fully compensate for the loss they had endured. Still, he urged the judge to impose the maximum penalty upon the convicted murderer. His words carried the weight of a grieving father, seeking justice for his beloved ex-wife and son. Similarly, Eugene K., Susan's brother, tearfully addressed the judge, struggling to find words to convey the deep pain inflicted by Talisi's callous actions. Through tears and deep breaths, he asked the judge to consider the profound cruelty and heartlessness displayed by the defendant as they determined the appropriate sentence. In an emotionally charged moment during the sentencing, Karen Eigen, the daughter and sister of Susan and Richard, was unable to attend in person. Instead, her best friend, Wendy Woods, read a heartfelt statement on her behalf. This statement conveyed the profound impact that the murders had on Karen's life, revealing that she had effectively lost her childhood on the day of the tragic events. Karen's statement expressed her bewilderment and disbelief that someone capable of committing such heinous crimes could still maintain their innocence. During their trial, Assistant District Attorney Robert Bianca Villa presented a compelling case against Louis Talisi. He charged that Talisi had a specific intent to rob the Eigens in order to support his cocaine habit. According to the prosecution's theory, Talisi broke into the Eigens' home with the intent to steal valuable items and money. However, the burglary took a horrifying turn when he encountered Susan Eigen inside the house. In the course of the robbery, Talisi assaulted and ultimately murdered Susan in a brutal act of violence. The situation escalated further when Richard Eigen unexpectedly entered the home during the burglary. The prosecution contended 
that fearing his crime would be exposed and unwilling to leave behind any witnesses, Talisi made the chilling decision to kill Richard as well. With the overwhelming evidence gathered by the cold case detectives and the prosecutor's compelling case during the trial, Louis Talisi had no viable defense. The evidence pointed unequivocally towards his involvement in the brutal crimes, leaving him with no way out of the situation. Talisi was finally charged with second-degree murder, kidnapping, burglary, and aggravated assault. During the sentencing hearing on June 2, 2004, Michael Eigen, the son and brother of the victims, addressed the court once again. In an emotional statement, he expressed the profound impact that the murders had on his life. Michael shared that the loss of his home, his mother, and his brother were among the many things stolen from him by Talisi. In recognition of the devastating losses suffered by the Eigen family and the heinous nature of the crimes, Nassau County Court Judge Joseph Calabrese handed down the sentence to Louis Talisi. The judge sentenced him to two consecutive 25 years to life prison terms for the 1984 murders of Susan and Richard Eigen, the Oceanside mother and son. Judge Joseph Calabrese made it clear to Talisi that he saw no reason to show any leniency or mercy towards him. The judge emphasized that the method by which Talisi had murdered his victims was deliberate and intended to cause maximum pain and suffering. Furthermore, Calabrese pointed out that Talisi had demonstrated no remorse for his actions throughout the entire trial process. Michael Eigen, after the sentencing, spoke to reporters and expressed his thoughts on Louis Talisi's continued insistence on his innocence. He stated that Talisi's refusal to admit guilt was consistent with a pattern of behavior in his life. Michael implied that his behavior might be indicative of Talisi's unwillingness to take responsibility for his actions. With the knowledge that Talisi would be behind bars for at least 50 years due to consecutive life sentences, Michael acknowledged that a certain portion of his mind found ease in knowing that the perpetrator would face the consequences of his crimes for a significant portion of his life. Michael was ready to begin the process of moving beyond the tragedy that had haunted them for so many years. In 2005, a year after being sentenced for the murders of Susan and Richard Eigen, Louis Talisi passed away while serving his prison sentence. His death marked the end of his life behind bars, cutting short the sentence imposed upon him by the court. So what are your thoughts on this case? Do you think the Eigen family finally found peace with Talisi's death after just one year of being behind bars? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendation in the comments section below. For more captivating true crime stories, like, share, and subscribe to our channel, Mysterious Hook.